Hello and welcome to the Sound of Science, the place where we deconstruct unscientific reasoning. Please consider to like and subscribe if you support science. Thanks for watching. Hello, you wonderful people. Thank you for watching. Today we're going to have a look at a video presented by Kyle Butt. He is a graduate of Freed Hardman University. Now that university is ranked among the absolute worst campuses for LGBTQ youth. I wonder if they take pride in that. Bruh. Now Kyle Butt has an interesting story for you and it's called Six Proofs for God's Existence. Now I have not listened to his story yet so I can't promise you it's going to be a huge Christian fail. However, I can promise you that every time Mr. Butt says something silly, I will interrupt him and correct him. Why did I choose to review a video of Mr. Kyle Butt? Well, some of the people in my comment section tell me that I only review videos of the bottom tier Christian apologists. So they asked me to step up my game a bit and Mr. Kyle Butt is known to be well, at least in Christian circles, some kind of authority on something. They invite him for debates all the time, but that of course doesn't mean that he's got something sensible to say. He's been writing books and stuff, but that of course doesn't prove that they are any good. So I thought, let's go back to the basics. Just start from scratch and see what he's got to say, and then we'll see if his arguments are any better than the nonsense that is proclaimed by the many budget apologists that we can find all over the internet. So let's do this. Socrates once stated that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. Stop right there. Now, of course, I cannot claim that referring to Socrates in itself is a silly thing to do, but starting your plea with a quote without giving any explanation what that quote is supposed to prove is not a good start because it gives the impression that you use that quote as some kind of argument from authority. So, for now, I'll have to dismiss it as being irrelevant. So, let's continue. When we look at the most profound question of life, does God exist? Again, stop right there. How did you establish that the most profound question in life is, does God exist? To me, that's not the most profound question at all. I just don't believe that God exists. So to me, there are other questions that are much more profound. For example, is there life in the universe outside of Earth? And what does it look like? What will the world look like a thousand years from now? What did the world look like a million years ago? What is there at the edge of the universe? To me, those are profound questions. The question if a God exists is pretty easy to be answered. There are no good reasons to believe that a God exists. So let's continue. Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. Yeah, let's do that. I can't wait. Let's see what you got. Number one, the universe must have a cause. Oh dear, oh dear, that's not a very good start. You're going to do the cause and effect thing. And it very much looks like you're going to play the word game here. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. See, I told you so. Mr. Butt is engaging in some refined and sophisticated word games here. Let me show you. First, is the law of cause and effect the most fundamental law of science? I don't know. I just hear a lot of Christian apologists call it that way. There are so many scientific laws, and most of them are very fundamental. So calling it the most fundamental law of science seems totally unnecessary to prove any point. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it, and that is greater than it. Wow, a scientific law with a nice definition phrased in the form of a quote. But the bigger question is, does the law of cause and effect even exist as a scientific law? If you Google this definition, the only results you get are of Christian apologists who try to make it look as if this phrasing has any scientific meaning. It hasn't. Your supposed law of cause and effect 
looks very much like a mumbo-jumbo version of Newton's third law of motion that states that to every action there's always a post an equal reaction. But why would you phrase a fantasy version of Newton's law? What are you aiming with that? Do you perhaps have some narrative to unfold? Like God created the universe and you need some tailor-made pseudo-scientific law to match that narrative? Because it very much looks like that. Maybe that's the game you're playing, maybe not. But it's always very suspicious if people come up with their own versions of established scientific laws. So, let's continue. The universe is a material effect. So what caused the universe? No, completely wrong, again, and obviously so. The universe is not an effect, it's a thing, or an object, if you will. It's the largest object we know to exist, but it's not an effect. In general, an effect is understood as a change in a condition. For example, a change in speed. Imagine an object floating through space with a particular speed, and then a few moments later, the speed of this object is changed. That is an effect. So, you don't just get to call the universe an effect. You first need to identify the change in condition regarding the universe. And that change in condition, that is your effect. And from there on, we could try to identify its cause. And of course, we can apply it the other way around. So that, for example, we see a change in speed of an object. And we want to find out if that will have any effects. And of course, it's more complicated because one cause can have multiple effects. And one effect can be caused by multiple causes. So your representation of what cause and effect are is not only far too simple, it's misleading. The universe is not an effect, it's a thing. Then why do you label the universe as an effect? I suspect because that will suit your narrative, which is that you want to dump down everything that happens in the universe to one simple cause being your god. But no. It doesn't work that way. First, identify a specific change in the universe that we can regard as your effect. And then we can look for a cause. If you don't believe in a creator... Stop right there again. Why would you, without any prior motivation, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, mention a creator? None of what you've said earlier gives any reason for that. So just as well, I could have said, well, if you don't believe in Gandalf and Frodo, up to now this was just a plea about cause and effect, and there is no reason whatsoever to bring up Gandalf, Frodo or God. While no argument, no evidence, no reason for the existence of a god has been addressed in this plea up to now. And why would you phrase it like that? If you don't believe in a creator, the tone of your voice suggests that not believing in a creator is not a logical option. All of this is a very strong example of Mr. Kyle Butt applying all kinds of language trickery, directing his plea into the narrative of his choice without using any proper arguments. So, let's see how he concludes his first proof of God. Then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. No, stop again. I don't have to propose anything. You didn't even propose any question. If the question were to be, how did the universe came into existence? I don't have to choose between a creator and a singularity. I can say we don't know, we're working on it. That would be a far more honest answer than giving credit to your favorite god. That happens to be the god your parents promoted to you. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. No, wrong again and condescending. A singularity and a Big Bang model is not popular today. It's the prevailing scientific model that most cosmologists for the past 50 years think to be the most reasonable and the most plausible explanation for how the universe came into existence. And no, the Big Bang was not an explosion. It's something in between sad, ridiculous and astounding that this needs to be explained over and over and over again to Christian apologists. This is really one of the basics of high school science class. An explosion is a chemical reaction 
For example, when hydrogen and oxygen come together, that is what an explosion is. The Big Bang was an expansion of material, not an explosion. But then when you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity? Maybe you should first try to understand what the difference is between an explosion and an expansion. First try to get to the bottom of that, because I'd predict that when you will attempt to understand what a singularity is, that is going to be a problem. Well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggests to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from nothing. <sighs> Sweet mother of Gandalf. No, that's not what a singularity is. Even only using my high school physics lessons, I can understand that that is not what a singularity is. The high school version of a singularity is a situation with endless density and a volume closing into zero. That is what a singularity is. Everything you say from this point on about a singularity is complete nonsense. Do you know that if there ever were a time when there was nothing, that's exactly what we would have now? The idea that something popped into existence from nothing is simply not a scientific idea. It's completely irrelevant if that is a scientific idea or not a scientific idea, because there's no scientist who claims that that is what a singularity is. Something coming from nothing is just what you falsely claim to be a singularity. And I think you know that that is false, yet you keep pretending that that is the scientific definition of a singularity, which it is not. Well then, so what are we left with? We're left with the fact that the universe had a beginning and it was not a natural cause. It was something above nature. It was something super nature, something supernatural. What we're left with is a dishonest charlatan who I thought was more of a serious Christian apologist who turns out to be deceiving and uninformed and has a habit of playing language games in order to misrepresent the ideas that science is proclaiming. He defines fake scientific laws into existence. He totally misrepresents the meaning of the word effect. He totally misrepresents what an explosion is, and he totally misrepresents what a singularity is. And he does all of that in about one minute of speech. You see, with this gentleman, Carl Butt, I run into the very same problems that I've experienced with the budget, amateur, low-tier Christian apologists. About every sentence they speak contains multiple flaws, and so my rebuttal get ten times longer than the actual plea that I respond to. Now, I made this video because I was looking for kind of a stronger challenge, if you will. But the plea of this gentleman, Kyle Butt, is so unbelievably flawed that I don't experience this as any challenge at all. When he makes a video which is called Six Proofs for God's Existence, and this is the first argument he comes up with, then it gets very doubtful if listening to the other five arguments is worth anyone's time. And that is where the only challenge in this video of Kyle Butt lies. And that is getting through it in the first place. You see, originally it was my idea to refute all six of Kyle's proofs for God. It turns out that he makes such a mess of his arguments that even refuting just one of his delusional talking points results in a full-length video. Remember that this man is seen within the Christian community as some kind of authoritative figure who is invited to lecture at universities and all kinds of institutions. Is this really the best that Christian apologetics has got to offer to me? I can't imagine. Well then, that was it for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next video.